Once again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Amin. My brothers and sisters, I will be speaking about some aspects of the life of the greatest of all messengers, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why do we say he's the greatest of all messengers? Well, that is what Allah told us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not only chosen him as the greatest of all messengers, but the most loved unto Allah, the best of creation. Like we always say, the most noble of all prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has chosen five of his messengers above others. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, تِلْكَ الرُّسُلُ فَضَّلْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ the messengers, we have raised some in level above others. So not all of them were of the same rank. So, you know, these messengers, these prophets, they were not of the same rank. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions five of them and he mentions some of them in the Quran. Some he doesn't mention in the Quran. Allah says, مِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَصَصْنَا عَلَيْكَ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ لَمْ نَقْصُصْ عَلَيْكَ from among these messengers, there are some whom we have related their stories to you and some whom we have not related their stories to you, so you wouldn't know them. Uh, amazing. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions five names in one verse. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِيثَاقَهُمْ وَمِنْكَ وَمِنْ نُوحٍ وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَ بْنِ مَرْيَمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who are known as Ulul Azmi min al Rusul. Those who were the most determined from among these messengers. They had the highest rank. They went through challenge upon challenge, uh, great challenges. And these challenges raised them in rank. If you look at the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah mentions him. Allah mentions Noah, Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, and, and Musa alayhi salam. So Isa, Musa, Nuh alayhi salatu was salam, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Ibrahim. Amazing. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon all of them. They went through difficulty, hardship, and I want to say something. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went through the greatest hardship, the greatest difficulty, challenge upon challenge. I always say, when we are talking about Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we need to realize Allah loved him the most. If Allah wanted, Allah could have actually facilitated his living on earth with the greatest of luxuries. But Allah wants us to know that when he loves you, it does not mean that he's going to shower upon you the luxuries of this world because those whom he loved more than you, he did not shower upon them the luxuries of this world, but he gave them contentment. Allah says in Surah Al-Furqan, تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي إِن شَاءَ جَعَلَ لَكَ خَيْرًا مِّن ذَلِكَ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي تَجْرِي مِن تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ وَيَجَعَلْ لَكَ قُصُورًا Glory be to Allah whom if he had willed, he could have made for you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, much better than everything they've had. He would have made for you gardens beneath which rivers were flowing and palaces he would have given you. But Allah says, you know, they have belied the hour. They don't even believe in the hour. So if we take a look at technology and the advancement we have, this technology, if Allah wanted, he could have let it be at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But all this advancement and all this luxury and all this technology and everything, Allah kept it for later on. Imagine we believe firmly in every aspect of the life of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but we haven't seen him with our eyes. The conviction in our hearts is even stronger than if we had seen him with our eyes. Meaning, we were not chosen to be from among the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yet we're totally convinced more than if we had seen something with our own eyes. I might belie my eyes if I were to see something, but I will never belie that messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his message. So what is the uniqueness? Revelation revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam such 
that there is no contamination in it. Allah says, we will take care of the Quran, we will protect it, we will ensure that it remains intact right up to the end. And that's exactly what happened. And if you look at the Quran today across the globe, there is one Mus'haf, one Quran. And subhanAllah, there might be a few dialects of reading it, it doesn't change the meaning, subhanAllah. Uh, and amazingly, even if I don't speak your language, you can actually correct me when I'm reciting the Quran just by the fact that you're a Muslim who prays five daily prayers. Subhanallah. You would know some of these surahs off by heart. But let's get into the difficulties and hardship faced by the most loved unto Allah. And I've chosen this aspect of his life because we're going through a very, very difficult period, a unique time where coronavirus has come in and changed a lot of the norms that we had before it came in. And it seems to be uh, a semi-long-term change, perhaps, who knows? May Allah protect us all and grant us return to life that is even better than what it was before. But more importantly, may Allah grant us a better relationship with Him than ever before. Because even if life did not return to normal, but you have a better relationship with Allah, you have succeeded. And if life returns to better than normal and you don't have a good relationship with Allah, then you have not succeeded. My brothers, my sisters, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bear in mind, best of creation, most noble of all prophets. His father passed away before he was born. Subhanallah. Allah chose for him to be born in a city and at a time when there was no advancement in terms of electricity, running water, the internet, mobile phones, motor vehicles, air aircraft, space jets, whatever else there might have been. But Allah favored him above everyone. He was born. When he was born, his father had already preceded or the death of his father had preceded his birth. So he was born an orphan. This is a consolation for all orphans. It is not because Allah is upset with you that you're an orphan. It is not because Allah does not love you and that's why he took your father away. No, perhaps he loves you more. Perhaps he loves you more. And that's why he took your father away. SubhanAllah, made you an orphan. And as Nabi Muhammad SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam grew a little bit older, do you know, he faced a hardship in Badia to Bani Sa'd when he was sent to Halima al Sa'diya, when he was sent to Halima, the wet nurse. And what happened is, at a certain time, Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and there was the incident of the washing of the heart at that particular juncture when he was very young of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And subhanAllah, he faced a difficulty, a hardship where he had to come back to his mother. And when he came back to his mother, a little while later, his mother passed away. He was only six years old, according to some of the narrations. So he stayed with his mother for about a year. According to the narrations, if he had come back at the age of five, most of the time he did not spend with his mother. And when he did, the mother then passed away when he was six years old, still very young. So no father, no mother. That is the most loved unto Allah. That difficulty and hardship did not mean that Allah didn't love him. Same applies to any one of us. If you faced hardship, difficulty, something happened to you, remember something. It does not mean Allah does not love you. Perhaps he loves you more than others. Take it in your stride and get closer to him. Thank Allah for whatever you do have. The hardships and challenges were faced by everyone. Subhanallah. More so those who were loved by Allah more. Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtala. When Allah loves a slave, he tests him more and more and more. You gain closeness to Allah and you realize the best thing you ever have is your relationship with your maker. That will never let you down. The more the hardship, we will not entertain shaitan. We will never let him make us lose hope. You might have lost your job. You might have lost so many things. You might have lost family members. Like I said, your parents. Let's look at what happened next. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his grandfather takes custody of him, looks after him. And two years later, his grandfather passes away as well. Imagine the age of eight. You've already lost three of the people who were taking care of you. One before you were born. The other one when you were six years old. And now a third one when you're eight years old. May Allah make it easy for all of us. I think many of us would think that perhaps Allah doesn't love you, Allah doesn't care for you. It's the opposite. 
Allah cares for you. Allah alone will take care of you. You might go through a few difficult years, but trust me, the victory is coming. Then the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was looked after by his uncle, Abu Talib. Abu Talib looked after the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and that's the father of Ali. But Ali radiallahu anhu was not yet born. He was born much later. And subhanallah, as he grew a fine young lad, he was known as the trustworthy. He was known as the truthful, the trustworthy. And it was amazing. He had a status in community and society from a very young age where they called on him at times in order to help them judge in disputes. On one occasion, there was a dispute regarding the stone, the black stone, when they were rebuilding the Kaaba and who exactly should carry it, which tribe is more deserving of it. They called Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He wasn't even a prophet yet, but prior to that, when he was much younger, and they decided we're going to ask him. And whatever he says, we will do. And he solved the matter in such a beautiful way. He asked the leader of every one of the tribes to hold a piece of the cloth and the, the stone was placed in the middle and all of them carried it to the Kaaba. And then he took it with his hands and placed it in its place. So that is something unique. They trusted him with this and it was the gift of Allah for him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant ease to everyone and grant us a lesson. You might be known as a trustworthy and honest person, but one day when you say something that people don't agree with or they don't like, everything will change and take it in your stride. That must not make you give up the truth or your honesty, but it is a lesson in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for you and I to continue in the obedience of Allah. But before I get to that point, there was a time when he went into business. Prior to that, he was a shepherd, part-time shepherd. He looked after flocks of livestock and amazing. He then did a bit of business. When he did business, who did he work for? He worked for a woman known as Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha. Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha was a businesswoman, Makkatul Mukarrama, well known. And she had been previously married. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a trip to Abyssinia or to Asham, not to Abyssinia, to Asham, to the, the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula, to what we know today as Syria, Lebanon, and that, that part of the, the world. So as he went there with the caravan, he came back and he presented every cent. That accountability was unique. How many of us are accountable? How many of us jot down or make a note of every single thing? Obviously, he was a person who didn't write and read for purposes that Allah had intended. That doesn't mean he was uneducated. He was the most highly educated from all because he brought to us everything we actually have. But to be unlettered is very different from being uneducated. So no one would ever dare say that he was uneducated because that is wrong. He was the most highly educated, but Allah didn't want him to read and write. So the term unlettered is used. Some people think it's a bad term. It's not a derogatory term. Allah wanted something. Allah says, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَلَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكِ إِذَا لَرْتَابَ الْمُبْطِلُونَ Allah says, prior to prophethood, you, you couldn't, you, meaning you didn't read a book and you didn't read or write. You didn't write with your right hand. Because then the, uh, those who wanted to find fault in revelation would have doubted and said that you copied it from elsewhere. So Allah protected you from that. But you were the most highly educated. So let's get these two in order. And let's understand, it's, it's, the derogatory term would be to say uneducated. But if you were to say that he didn't read or write, that is in the Quran, undeniable. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us. So uh, when he made a note of whatever happened in the business trip and he came back with lots of prophets and so on, and this lady who was much older than him interacted with him, she decided, you know what, this would be a good man to marry. And 
the message got across to him and mashallah they ended up getting married. I learned so many things from this life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu this story of his where he, he was proposed to directly or indirectly but the idea came to him at the peak of his youth 25 years old and mashallah someone much older than him who was previously married who had children and subhanallah he was faced with should I or shouldn't I immediately he accepted the proposal because she was fit to be the mother of his children she was an honest upright person dedicated and that's it obviously when the deen came, she supported him completely. She was the first from among the women to accept Islam. In fact, it is said she was the first person completely to accept Islam. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu married a much older woman. And this was at the peak of his life. People say, Na'udhu Billah, Astaghfirullah, may Allah protect us and forgive us. People say that he was a womanizer. How can he have been a womanizer when at the age of 40, at the age of 25, he married someone much older than him who was previously married and he never married anyone in, in that particular time when he was married to her. And he always says she was my strength and my pillar of support and he always maintained a good relationship with her friends later on as well and their families. So, it goes to show that later on when he was much older and he married other women, there was a divine reason for that. Subhanallah. And people uh, find fault in things and they just want to look for something to speak about in order to discredit. They will only be discrediting themselves, no one else. Even the kuffar of Quraysh, meaning the disbelievers of Quraysh, did not pick on those things. They didn't because they knew that this man was noble. He was honest. He was honorable. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he married her and Alhamdulillah they had their children and later on one day uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu decided to meditate and he used to meditate often in the cave of Hira and uh, he got into the cave. He, what did he used to think about? He used to ponder over the evil that the people used to do and ways of correcting them, uh, you know, concern about his community, his people, they had some really bad ways. Those ways were known as al-jahiliya, the ignorance, you know, the jahala, the period of ignorance and the actions and deeds were also ignorant. Worshipping deities besides Allah, worshipping whatever else, you know, idols and uh, sticks and stones what, and so many other things. So he used to ponder how on earth can this be corrected and he used to uh, seclude himself in this cave and Jibreel alayhi salam came to him one day with revelation. Iqra, read. Naturally, ma ana biqari. Iqra, read. Ma ana biqari. I'm not a reader. Read. Ma ana biqari. Read in the name of Allah. In the name of Allah, you can do anything. I want to stop there again. Brothers and sisters, another lesson. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible in the name of Allah. If you were to start things in the name of Allah, nothing is impossible. If you are to actually uh, seek the help of Allah, everything becomes possible. What you thought was impossible for Allah is very possible. He will do it for you. So in other words, nothing is impossible for Allah. Imagine, iqra' bismi rabbik. Read in the name of Allah. Read in the name of your Lord who created you. Khalaq. Khalaq al-insan. He created mankind from a clot of blood. Subhanallah, Rabbil Alameen, amazing verses. These were the opening verses to do with read and to do with using the name of Allah when you think something is impossible and Allah will make it possible and Allah will grant you even more than you ever expected because you did it in His name with His help and you continued seeking that help of His. That's Allah. Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal. So, then revelation came to him, he came down from that cave and he embraced his wife and she reassured him that you're a good man, you're a truthful person and it, Allah will not let you down. And uh, she took him to her cousin Waraka ibn Nawfal. And uh, Waraka had a little bit of knowledge of revelation. And so Waraka ibn Nawfal said, if this is the case, then this man is going to be sent to the people as a prophet. Now one might say, but wasn't that the beginning of prophet? That was the beginning of revelation. That was the beginning, yes, of prophethood. But at the same time, Allah did not instruct him at that moment yet to go out and warn the people. That came later on. Ya ayyuhal qum fa'anvir. When revelation came, O you who's enveloped, 
Get up and warn the people. Then he was sent to the people and he was given instruction. So Waraka, he said, if I am alive when this man is given instruction and sent to his people, I will believe in him, according to one of the narrations. So basically, the people immediately divided into two, those who accepted and those who rejected. Those who accepted from among them Ali bin Abi Talib who was living with Muhammad وسلم, and the reason why he was living with Muhammad وسلم, was as follows. His father Abu Talib was looking after Muhammad وسلم. when Muhammad وسلم, was young, the age of eight, it started and he took care of him for many years and later on Abu Talib struggled with uh, finances. And so his children were divided among some of the relatives and taken care of by some of the relatives because of financial struggles. And so the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, volunteered to take care of Ali and Ali was quite young, uh, Ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. So he took care of Ali. Ali grew up in his home, uh, uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And at the time of the prophethood, Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was considered a boy. He was considered a young boy. That's why they say from among the boys, the first was Ali to accept Islam. From among the men, the first was Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And from among the women, the first was Khadija binti Khawailid radiallahu anha. May Allah bless them all. So Abu Bakr then spoke to some of his friends and a lot of them came forth. This is why if you take a look at the 10 who have been given glad tidings of paradise, known as Al-Ashara Al-Mubashirina Bil-Jannah, many of them, they were brought into Islam by Abu Bakr. They were the friends of Abu Bakr, As-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr was the friend of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa It was their circle. This goes to show another point, something we learn from this story. You will be influenced by your friends, definitely, unless you influence them. So when you have a circle of friends, you start doing what they do, whether you know or you don't know. When you have a circle of friends, they start doing what you do at times, if you are the dominant person. And this is very important. Keep good friends so that goodness comes out of that friendship and not bad. A lot of the people who denied the message, they, they were of a certain clique. They were of a certain circle. They denied the message and those who harmed the Prophet ﷺ, they were also a certain clique. So if you look at these little friendship circles, each one of them reacted differently. The friends of Muhammad ﷺ, they were the ones who accepted him. They knew him the most. You take a careful look at who accepted the message. Wallahi, it was those who knew him the most. And this is why we are taught that if you want to know more about a person, look at his family members his wife to begin with, or the husband in the case of a woman, uh, the children, you know, ask them, uh, the friends, the closest friends, look at whom they befriend and ask them, you know, an acquaintance, a business partner and a friend. Those are three different things. Not every business partner is your friend, not every acquaintance is your friend, not every acquaintance is a business partner and so on. So we're only talking about friends, those who are really close to you and you know, you, you, you're with them nearly every other day, if not every day. Now, with us, we're taught to build good circles. You attend the masjid every day. You have a good circle of people who don't harass you. They have good character and conduct or they're taking from your character and your conduct. So my brothers and sisters, that is a very important factor. Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's friends helped each other. They accepted Islam, but there were, there was a group and there were other people who rejected. Immediately they called him a liar, a false person. They accused, accused him of wanting power, wanting money, wanting, you know, womanizing or whatever else it was. A lot of accusations, being a sorcerer, a magician. All those words, remember them because if people have accused you of being a magician, doing black magic on someone, uh, wanting money, running after power, wanting fame, wanting this one, they have accused the Prophet Muhammad of the same thing. So it's nothing new. In fact, it's a sign of the love of Allah for you. If those accusations are not true, then thank Allah. I mean, a lot of us would get it when you're starting to spread the deen. People will refute you unjustified, which means if it was justified, it's okay. But without any justification. They will hate on you. They don't even know you. They've never met you. Don't worry. Thank Allah. That must make you smile. Alhamdulillah. Allah loves you. Allah, if it happened to the Prophet Sallallahu so now look at you. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala bless every one of us. 
And so don't worry about these accusations, but don't be from among those who accuses others with the same accusations because then you've just joined the wrong circle. Interesting. That's a very powerful point. Now let me move on because I don't have much time. Unfortunately, the timing is very limited. But let me explain one more thing. The Prophet ﷺ at a certain point in his life lost all of his children one after the other. Besides one, Fatima radiallahu anha outlived him. The rest of them, he lost them either in infancy or adulthood. And to be honest with you, any one of us who goes through that hardship, remember it's not the sign of rejection of Allah. Allah doesn't hate you. Perhaps it's the sign of the love of Allah because it happened to the one, the one whom uh, he loved the most. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa people went to war with him. People, uh, you know, refused food and water to go to him, accused him falsely, tried to hit him, tried to kill him. Allah protected him. All those are not signs that Allah dislikes you. There are signs that Allah loves you. So with this virus, with the loss of jobs, with the loss of lives, with the change of lives, it's not a sign that Allah dislikes you or hates you. Perhaps it's because Allah loves you. It's all in the heart. It's all about the condition of the heart. Are you pleased with Allah? Allah is pleased with you. Are you okay? Are you content? It's a contentment that Allah has promised you. Yes. Well, if that's the lesson we've learned from the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then that is a powerful lesson. So for this particular lecture, I will suffice at this. And inshallah, I pray that we've all learned a beautiful lesson from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life. Like I said, stories from the Prophets, uh, may peace be upon them. These were some of the lessons I thought perhaps might be relevant for us today with this virus. And may Allah bless every one of us. Aqulu qawli hadha. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa